Hello and welcome back, Royal Family. First week of the month, 11-2. 11-2-21, that is the date, which means we're probably going to be doing the Lord's Supper. I try to do it in the first couple of days of the month. Sometimes it gets a little tricky for me, uh, but I normally do it almost all the time within the first two messages of the month. Just so you know, going forward, you... Uh, want to do the Lord's Supper with me, I offer it every month, beginning of every month, so you can do it with me here. If you consider yourself part of the congregation, anytime somebody's doing the Lord's Supper, you should probably do it anyway. It doesn't matter if you have to do it two or three times a week. It's a good uh, practice to do it, especially with other believers and a pastor that you believe is teaching you accurately. You should probably do it. So today's lesson is Matthew lesson 387, 387 of the Matthew series. The Resurrection of the Nation of Israel is the title. The Resurrection of the Nation of Israel is the title. We will do the Lord's Supper, as I said, at the end of the message. That's normally how I do it. I have my stuff kind of set up over here. I got my little uh, juice and my cracker set up over here. Um, so we'll do it at the end of the message because we are in the first week of the month and we always bring forth the Lord's Supper during the first week of the month. Please be prepared. You can stop the video feed or the whatever it is now, whatever you're listening to it, and you can go get some juice and crackers. It's all symbolic. Uh, that's all you need is a little piece of bread, a little piece of cracker, and some type of juice. So please be prepared with that by the end of the message. We are going to open back up in Matthew chapter 24. You are welcome to jump back into Matthew chapter 24. I don't have any major announcements. Um, we're getting ready to jump in the Word of God. I want to keep everything and everyone in prayer. A lot going on in this world. Uh, I believe it's a uh, pastor and a gentleman that was a uh, ran a uh, Christian company. I forgot what it was called. His name is Russ Dizdar. And uh, Russ went home to be with the Lord about 10 days ago, I think, two weeks ago. And uh, I heard about it, and I forgot to mention it last week. But... Um, I didn't always agree with every doctrinal principle he said, but the thing that he did that was phenomenal was he rescued children and women from human trafficking, certainly little children from satanic cults. And he specialized in that. Rescued probably, you know, well over 100 children in the last 15 or 20 years or whatever. I heard, I heard it was several hundred. I don't have the exact statistics, but he went home to be with the Lord a couple weeks ago. And listen, sometimes you don't agree with everybody's doctrinal stance. Maybe there's somebody that's into a denomination and they won't stray away from the denominational dogma that's there, but they believe in Jesus Christ and they're doing some things in their community or around their area and hopefully not doing it um, with, the, uh, with the flesh, but with the spirit. They understand how to be filled with the spirit. And what they're doing is really good. And you need to applaud those people and lift them up. Um, you can try to teach them the principle of being filled with the Spirit and what the Christian way of life and studying the Bible accurately is all about. Uh, but we at least need to give them an applaud and a pat on the back and a that a boy or that a girl when you have Christians that are out there trying to make a difference, certainly rescuing little children. Certainly. So um, there's a lot of that. People don't realize the biggest industry right now in the last 10 years that surpassed drug smuggling and drug dealing surpassed drug smuggling and drug dealing as the biggest industry is not only human trafficking it's child sex trafficking slavery is alive and well a lot of people don't realize that they think it's all oh, that's an ancient thing i can tell you right now statistically if you look at every aspect of slavery across the world it is more prevalent today than it was 2000 years ago if you counted the heads of everybody involved in it more prevalent today than it was 2000 years ago just because you're not hearing it on the mainstream media all the time doesn't mean it's not out there. It simply means they know certain things and they're involved in certain things and they're not telling you the truth. I won't go any further with that. We'll keep that in prayer. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow, I may grow, we all grow in respect to our salvation. Never stop growing. Whether you're a pastor, a deacon, or you've been in the word for 30 or 40 years, never stop growing and learning. Let us prepare to take in the word of God. In doing so, 
we will look at what the, the Apostle John wrote about to believers. 1 John 1 8. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. 1 John 1 9. If we confess believers our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. Let's get prepared for the whole message today, the Lord's Supper, everything. Take a moment of silent prayer. Let's keep everything in prayer. A lot, a lot to pray for. And let's keep our brothers and sisters in Christ in places like Australia and Canada, uh, China, and pockets of the UK, United Kingdom, and Europe that are being suppressed by their government and they're, they're having a dictatorship put over them concerning vaccines and viruses. Please keep them in prayer. Don't forget, we have some loyal followers over, certainly over in Australia, I can tell you that. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Well, Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. Father, I'm just asking that you lift up the, the followers of this channel and the congregation, the small little congregation. Let them learn the doctrine they need to learn, apply it, get out there and amongst their family and friends and, and be able to uh, act as believer priests and ambassadors and soldiers for Christ in this battle that we're all in. Father, I'm asking you to touch the pockets across this world in Australia, in China, Canada, Mexico, uh, the United Kingdom, and pockets of Europe, the Middle East. Wherever there are positive believers, we know they are being suppressed and certain things are going on, Father, that are, on, that are really considered tyranny. Father, we're just asking you to touch all those areas. We're asking for you to bless those believers that lift this ministry up. And we're asking for all these things. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be prepared again. Lord's Supper at the end of the message. Let us open back up in Matthew chapter 24. And we're going to read right through Matthew 24, 21 into verse 31. So we'll cover most of that, what we touched on last lesson. And I want to read right through because it's going to anchor us um, into where I want to go and where I think the Spirit wants us to go. So we're going to read right through from 21 to 31. I'll give you a little narrative in between if you haven't been here to keep you up to date on what's been being taught lately. Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be a great tribulation, Jesus said, relating now to the seven-year tribulation period. Such has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor will ever again. In the, old, the words of Jesus Christ, he's saying the seven-year tribulation period is going to be unmistakable. I believe with the study we have done in recent lessons, you are getting the sense that the buildup, the buildup to the second advent of Christ is nothing like we have ever seen before because you have to get through the seven years of tribulation before you get to the second advent. It's very unique. It is all the earth is going to change. It is what we can call an earth-changing set of events that will unfold. Earth-changing. Matthew 24, 22. In those days, and if those days, Jesus said, had not been cut short, no life would have been saved but for the sake of who? Elect, chosen, believers, those days will be cut short. Matthew 24, 23. Then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, the Messiah, or he's over here, do not believe him if you're in that tribulation and you're watching this message. The reason Jesus wants the apostles to know this is not because he is trying to confuse them about whether they will face it or not in their lifetime. It is because he knows they are the men responsible for the completed canon of Scripture. That's why he's saying it. He knows they're not going to be there in the tribulation. Jesus is well aware of that. And, and I would tell you, the apostles probably have a hint to that, but they're not 100% sure. And what he does is he makes sure they understand the whole concept because they're responsible for... For completed canon of scripture the what the bible you hold in your hand matthew 24 24 24 for false christ plural false messiahs false prophets plural meaning many will arise and will provide great signs and wonders so as to mislead if possible even the believers the elect that will happen before the tribulation it's going on right now it went on back in the days of the apostles it will go on in a multiple, um, I would say multiplied, multiplied today by a hundred. And that's what you're going to have 
during the tribulation period as far as confusing signs and wonders and messiahs and different false Christ and false prophets and counterfeits. Matthew 24, 25, Behold, Jesus said, I've told you in advance. Now you know. Now he doesn't end there. He's going to groom this a little bit further. Matthew 24, 24, 26. So if they say to you, look what he reminds them again. If they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness. Do not go out. In other words, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, has returned. Do not go out. Or behold, he's in the inner rooms. Do not believe them. The continual warning sunk in to the apostles about Satan's counterfeits because it is well documented, well covered within the letters and the writings of the New Testament, the apostles and those followers of Christ. Well documented in the New Testament. So all these warnings about counterfeits, Satan's counterfeits, didn't fall on deaf ears. Matthew 24, 27. And good thing it didn't. Good thing it didn't. Like I told you, the Holy Spirit pressed on my heart about false teachers, Satan's counterfeit, counterfeit systems. Satan has pressed that on my heart in recent weeks to really press it on you. So back then, Jesus was telling them, pay attention. A lot of counterfeits. Satan is the expert. Matthew 24, 27. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will the coming of Son of Man be. Matthew 24, 28. Wherever the corpse is... There the vultures will gather. He's using kind of a, a, a little analogy. Another thing to keep an eye for, the warning about the corpses is the warning that as his second appearance, his second coming, his second advent, he will come first as what? A warrior king. Very powerful fashion. A violent, powerful fashion. He'll return. And vultures go to the dead bodies. So that's your... Uh, Jesus Christ speaking the truth of when he returns. A lot of people don't like to look at Jesus in that light. Sorry to tell you. Matthew 24, 29. We'll focus on a couple of these scriptures today, 29 to 31. Matthew 24, 29. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, seven years are up, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky. This means the second advent is now coming upon them. And the powers of the heaven will be shaken. These are all well covered in the book of Revelation. As I pointed out last lesson, also in Old Testament prophecy. I showed you some things last lesson that you should have put down in your notes. The war of Armageddon will have begun. And that is actually after a period of many months of demonic angelic activity across the world. Just so you know, there's some things that happen towards that last... It's in that last three and a half years, and people debate whether it's the last six months or the last year, last five months. Uh, but there will be demonic angelic activity along with this military operation that ends up being the Battle of Armageddon. So the world will be ripe with evil. Good way to describe it. It will be ripe with evil, destruction, and chaos. That will be all over the place by the time you get in that last year of the seven-year tribulation. It will more than likely ignite the war of Armageddon at some point, And that will happen with a few nuclear bombs detonated probably at the very beginning of that war, which will set into motion a series of events on the earth. And that opens up that sixth seal as well. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will have been breaking the seven seals in heaven prior to this. As I taught you last lesson, as he breaks the sixth seal... That is the spark for a set of catastrophic, catastrophic events like earthquakes, volcanoes, and meteor showers. The surface of the earth will shift and change. There's no way around it. Even the atmosphere will be ripe, I would say ripped, not ripe, ripped open in destructive fashion. Even the atmosphere itself will be ripped open in destructive fashion. So you have... This period of ripe evil happening all over the place. Destruction and all of these demonic things happening. And then the Battle of Armageddon will spark right towards the end of the seven years. When it sparks, it's believed, not just by me, it's believed by certain theologians and scholars, that some nuclear detonations may happen which will cause some catastrophic events and that sixth seal will break open and the atmosphere itself may even rip open the skies. 
the warfare in the end times of the seven years of tribulation is a buildup of several different armies from the west, east, and north. Several different armies will come to converge on the Valley of Megiddo, is where Armageddon takes place. Many believe it will be a Chinese and Russian force combined, and also a strong force of Middle Eastern troops and perhaps European armies involved as well. We have yet to see that, how that will all unfold. Some will be against Satan and his military and his demonic forces, and others will be on his side. Again, you have yet to see all of that play out. There's a large portion of the world that will side with Satan and Satan's one world agenda. All the forces, all the forces against Satan are not all believers, so do not get that confused. Just because they're going up against Satan, it may mean they just want their own sovereignty. This will be a buildup of superpowers during that time, whoever the superpowers, and I'm going to tell you, superpowers are beginning to shift. America is in the process of dwindling as a superpower, just so you know. That this will be a buildup of superpowers, and every military or political leader will have a certain agenda. Many will be on the side of Satan's agenda. Some will not. Doesn't mean they're believers. Some will be. This will be a time of great evil, greed, and panic, because it will be obvious that after the three and a half year point of the tribulation, that Satan and his army are in the process of a full takeover. So understand that. Understand that when the light bulb goes off sometime after the three and a half year mark, there are some people that wake up, maybe they become believers, but maybe even if, even if they don't become believers, they're in positions of military or political leadership and they say, wait a minute, we gotta gather our forces. This guy, this Antichrist is doing a full takeover. There's demonic activity going on. He's building his military. We need to do something. So there is a big buildup in that last year, I would say, of the seven-year tribulation period. Matthew 24, 30. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. So we know it's towards the end. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the, up on the clouds of the sky with power and great, great glory. Now most of the time, when they're talking about tribes here, Certainly, it depends on how Jesus uses it or how it's being used. A lot of times, tribes talked about the tribes of Israel, the, tw the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 bloodlines of Israel. The mourning tribes will probably be related to the Jews. That's almost, I'm almost 100% sure that's what it's related to. The mourning tribes will probably be related to the tribes of the Jews, whatever bloodlines are still out there. There will be a great symbol or a sign within the skies. Even after the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has split the Mount of Olives and laid waste to the majority of the military forces, there will be some type of symbol that goes up after that, his military victory. The smoke and darkness will probably evaporate very quickly, and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will send forth a heavenly regiment of angelic soldiers across the skies of the world and there will be a supernatural calling and gathering of all the Jews into one place. I'm going to say that again. Let me get a drink and understand what I'm telling you. I know some of this is a mouthful to absorb. I'm doing my best to break it down for you so it becomes very simple for you to put in your notes. There will be a great symbol or a sign within the skies even after the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has split the Mount of Olives and laid waste to the majority of the military forces. So it will probably be after the victory, shortly thereafter. The smoke and darkness will evaporate, and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will send forth a heavenly regiment of angelic soldiers across the skies of the world, and there will be a supernatural calling or a regathering of all Jews into one place obviously in front of the Lord, and, and we know that to be in Israel, in Jerusalem. Matthew 24, 31. And he, Jesus, will send forth his angels, there it is right there, angelic forces, with a great trumpet blast. So they're, they're called to do something out in the skies, in the atmosphere that draws everybody's attention across the world. They will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky 
to the other. This is specific though, folks. This is specific signal and a call to bring forth every Jewish person alive or dead. You heard me, alive or dead into one group in front of our Lord. Remember how the rapture of the church, I showed you in Thessalonians and in Corinthians, how it says there's a trumpet blast and we meet the Lord in the, in, the, in the clouds of the sky and the dead in Christ rise first from the church age? It's the same thing with the Jewish believers. So there's a call to so the Jewish believers, even those that have passed away, that have been dead for thousands of years, come forth. And those that have been across the world gathered together, it all takes place in front of our Lord. Turn to Isaiah chapter 26, royal family. Isaiah 26. It's very similar to the call of the rapture of the church, the church age believers. But this is specific to the nation of Israel, the Jews. It's just so you know, specific to the Jews. Isaiah chapter 26 is where you're going, 26. All believers worldwide will naturally be drawn to Israel to be with the Lord, but there is a set of angels gathered, uh, called actually to gather every Jew in front of Christ. Certainly every believing Jew in front of Christ. Many of these scriptures were written about the Old Testament prophets, and so it's not part of mystery doctrine what I'm telling you here. It's really not, because it would fall under mystery doctrine if the Old Testament believers, or it was a mystery to those studying prior to. It was openly taught for many years by the priests and prophets. This was openly taught for many years by priests and prophets throughout the Jewish culture. Daniel 12, 11, there it is right there. And from the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, we know that happened somewhere around the midway point. Three years, three and a half years, it could vary a little bit. There will be a hundred, what, 1,290 days. These are supposed to be literal days from what I know. Verse 12, blessed is the one who is patient and obtains to 1,335 days. Why is Daniel saying that? Think about the math. Think about halfway point of seven years, around three, three and a half years, give or take a few weeks. The 1290 represents a little over three and a half years. Add 45 days of darkness or earthquakes and also the cleanup of bodies, and what do you come to? You should come to that 1335. Understand that. The 45 added on to that. I'll explain to the best of my ability. Daniel is prophesizing about the last days of the seven years of tribulation period, what we are studying, which means those last days open up. That sixth seal has been popped open at some point or another, and Christ is ready to return, or has returned. That's what this talks about. Which means those 45 days probably represent the time of the sixth seal being broken. It's a good question to ask. Possibly shortly before the beginning of the 45 days, that seal is broken, and all hell breaks loose on earth. So you can go either or. We can debate about several days or several weeks. So possibly either at the time of the 45 days or shortly before the beginning of those 45 days. That seal, that sixth seal for the second advent is broken and all hell breaks loose on earth. We simply don't know how that's all going to work. I'm just showing you some of these things are pointing out the exact things that we are studying and we can start to put them together in line scripture up with scripture and get a visual. Now, we can argue about, well, this many weeks will have passed or that many days and this pastor or this scholar said this or that i don't get into those kind of debates if they're all, if they're if they're with me on the same template i'm not going to argue over that i don't have all the exact times and dates there are two or three beliefs that follow the order of the seven seals in revelation and i think next lesson we're going to dive into that study a little bit let me say that again there are two or three theological principles that follow the order of the seven seals in Revelation. And I think next lesson, we will dive into that study and clarify. I think that's where the Spirit's going to lead me. I told you, be prepared for Matthew chapter 24 to be long. I don't know how long it's going to take. It could take us two months to get through it. I don't know. We could get through it in a couple more weeks. I simply don't know. I always do my best. I always do my best to present the theology that has real substance, folks. 
real substance and is widely taught and I offer you what I believe is coming forth from the scriptures and what God the Holy Spirit reveals to me. I'm very transparent with what I teach and what I show you. That is why you often hear me tell you that some scholars or historians or theologians believe one thing while others may teach a different version. I tell you that all the time. You often hear me say, well, some scholars or theologians say A, B, and C. And I try to line it all up with you so you can absorb it all. And I usually tell you where I come down on it and what the Spirit shows me. I usually cap that statement off after I tell you certain scholars or theologians believe A, B, or C. I usually cap that statement off with what I am confident it means. So I'm telling you that 45 days, I'm confident, is in and around the sixth, the breaking of the sixth seal. When exactly? I don't know. Contrary to what some teachers tell you, nobody, repeat, nobody has every detail and exact timetable and definition figured out when it comes to prophetic scriptures. Nobody. And I know that's going to rub some people the wrong way because, unfortunately, a lot of people, I found this out over the years, even in the lineage I'm from, from some great men, they elevate uh, the teacher sometimes to a point where everything he says has to be copied exactly or the people lose their mind. The people that follow that one teacher now, maybe they follow, they lose their mind. So they elevate the teacher so high, he's almost like a deity. You need to be careful of that. Contrary to what some teachers tell you, nobody has every detail and exact timetables and definitions figured out when it comes to prophetic scriptures. Definitely not scriptures related to eschatology, end times. Definitely not. I know the man that trained me, I, I listened to him teach two or three principles over a course of 10 years, I remember, related to the end times, and there was a couple of avenues that he said, this could happen this way, it could be this way or that way. I'm of that school, I was taught very well. Thank you, Pastor Bob. Shout out to Grace Bible Church, Pastor Bob in New England. What I can tell you is, the sixth seal being broken is related to the second advent of Christ, and it represent a closing of the seven years of tribulation. Obviously, if Christ is returning, the tribulation's ending. Sixth seal obviously comes at the end of the seven year tribulation period. Now, the seventh seal is related to the beginning of demonic activity. So, I know that might sound confusing. That's why we're going to need to get into this. Because from the seventh seal comes seven trumpet judgments from the seventh seal in fact you can read the sixth seal i think it's in chapter six it begins but you don't get into the seventh seal until a couple of chapters later like chapter eight of revelation we're going to look at it and there's a reason for that because when you read in between all those things before you get to the seventh seal being broken you realize it sounds like you're going back to the first couple of seals i'll explain it to you the seventh seal is related to the beginning of demonic activity think about that because from the seventh seal comes forth the seven trumpet judgments. So if you want a little homework between now and Thursday, <laughs> I guess you could read chapter six, seven, and eight. Look for the seals being broken in Revelation. You'll see what I'm saying. The seventh seal being broken is really a bigger part of demonic activity, which appears to connect to the initial breaking of the first few seals. Man's ways and God's ways, two different things. The seventh seal being broken is really a bigger part of demonic activity, which appears to connect to the initial breaking of the first few seals. The seventh seal and seven trumpets it introduces brings forth judgment in demonic fashion, fallen angels. So it's kind of special, that seventh seal. Seven being God's perfect number of completion. It is unleashed after the midway point of the tribulation we are talking in the sixth seal at the end of the tribulation the seventh seal appears to be broken prior to the sixth seal the seventh seal appears to be broken prior to the sixth seal i guess you'll have to tune in to the next couple lessons to figure it out it is the supernatural release of angelic forces upon the earth the seventh seal and the seven trumpets Daniel 12 goes on to tell us more, Daniel 12, 13. But as far as you, he's talking to the Jews, 
Who's Daniel talking to? The Jews. I don't want to confuse you with all that seal breaking. We're back into where we were. But as for you, Jews, go your way to the end. Then you will rest, oftentimes rest or sleep, meant to die and rise up for your allotted portion at the end of the age. What are we talking about? Resurrection here. This speaks to the Old Testament Jews already who've passed away and now a recall to appear in front of who? Jesus Christ. What's our study in Matthew 24 tell us? There's a resurrection call for Jews. That's it right there. You're seeing it in Scripture prophetically in Daniel. I'll show you a couple more. Scripture has to line up with Scripture, folks. That's part of interpreting your Bible the right way. This is the same type of prophecy in Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah 26, 19. Isaiah 26, 19. Your dead will rise. Remember, you're dealing with the nation of Israel. Your dead will rise. Their corpses will rise. Jews, you who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy. You wouldn't be shouting for joy if you were an unbelieving Jew. For your dew is as the dew of the dawn. Dew means fresh and new. Everything's watered down. And the earth will give birth to the departed spirits. This is prophecy related to the second advent. There's no other way to align this, these scriptures up. But with the second advent, which line up with the book of Revelation in certain portions, and Matthew 24, where we are studying. This is the exact time that the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has wiped out the armies and now stands to call the nation of Israel out. So what's going on? The fifth cycle of discipline is about to end. The fifth cycle of discipline for the Jews, nation of Israel, is about to end. It is also a time called the baptism of fire. I've covered this before. There's actually a, a baptism of fire for Gentiles and Jews. I'm not going to get into that. I don't want to confuse anybody. I'm trying to show you Matthew 24 and highlight scriptures that align with that. Matthew 26, 20. Come, my people, Jews, my people, Isaiah, prophet, Jewish, nation of Israel. Enter your rooms and close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while until indignation runs its course. This is part of end time scripture. The Jews were alive and under attack leading up to the final battle of Armageddon. So he's telling you these things are all going to take place. Now how they take place and the order they take place, we're going to look at that. I'm going to get you as close as I can and you're going to make your judgment calls. This is telling us the Jews in the end times are to do what? They're to hide. What does it say? What did Jesus say? You better run. Woe to those who are pregnant. Get off the roof. Get out of the fields. Don't grab your gear. Run after the abomination of desolation. Same thing. The Jews who are alive and under attack leading up to that final battle of Armageddon. Be careful those last three and a half years. Jews, there's a target on your back. Zaham is the word. Zaham means the wrath or abomination of anger. It means the wrath or abomination, uses the word abomination, interesting, in the original Hebrew, abomination of anger poured out on the earth. It's like somebody taking a big bucket of anger and wrath and abomination and pouring it out on the earth. Those three and a half years will be hell on earth for Jews and believers, certainly Jews. They will have a target on their back. I don't know any other way to tell you. Jesus is alerting them to that. Isaiah 26, 21. Look at verse 21. You guys should be in Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26, 21. For behold, the Lord is about to come out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their wrongdoings. All pointing to the second advent. And the earth will reveal her bloodshed and will no longer cover her slain. In other words, the earth is going to suffer for a period of time. Something big is happening. Second advent, the coming of the second advent, that's all this is pointing to. It points out the same prophecy earlier in Isaiah's writing in chapter 13. Same prophecy, it aligns with Daniel, Matthew, Revelation, they all align. Isaiah 13, 9 on the board. Behold, the day of the Lord is come, and I told you a lot of times that meant the second advent, how it was written. Cruel, Jesus Christ. I know everybody wants to do the love and peace and the skinny little hippie Jesus Christ that everybody walked upon. Sorry to tell you. Cruel with fury and burning anger. 
warrior king to make the land a desolation. He changed. When he comes down, some bad things happen prior to and when he steps down. And he will exterminate its sinners from it. Yeah, Jesus Christ, second advent. Obviously, part of the end times altogether, even after the thousand years of reign, there is a judgment as well. Verse 10, for the stars of the heaven and their constellations will not flash their light. In other words, something happens in the skies and the earth. The sun will be dark. There it is right there. When it arises and the moon will not shed its light. What does it tell you? What did we study recently, last lesson, about the darkening of the skies, the rip in the atmosphere, volcanic ash, earthquakes, all of these things happening. Many of the Old Testament prophets spoke about the day of the Lord concerning the second advent of Christ, the second coming. It was not a mystery. It was not a mystery concerning the assault on the earth and all these things I'm showing you. Daniel, Isaiah, it's, it's, it's aligned everywhere in the scriptures. Amos, look at Amos 5 on the board. Amos 5, 18. Woe to you who are longing for the day of the Lord. You keep wanting them to come back. You have no idea. You're clueless about the events, in other words. That's where the rubber meets the road today. Hey, you're clueless. You keep asking about the, the Lord to come. You're clueless. Certainly you Jews that aren't even following scripture. For what purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? Certainly if you're an unbelieving Jew... It will be darkness and not light. There it is right there. I would say look at Joel chapter 2 and into chapter 3 and you'll see end time prophecy there. Same thing we're talking about. Ezekiel chapter 32. Read that. Zechariah 14. I'm putting them on. I'm listing them on there for you. You realize this isn't a mystery to the Jews who really studied their Bible concerning the second advent and how volatile and painful it would be. Why? Because they've suffered through that last portion of discipline, the seven years. Christ comes back in military fashion first. There is a resurrection of the nation of Israel that will happen after the Lord deals with the military situation upon his return. So the return immediately is, is warrior king. After that, some things happen. The resurrection of the nation of Israel is, is one. Now, again, you want to argue, does it happen 40 days, 20 days, 30 days, immediately? I'm not going to give you any dates or times on that. I'd be a fool. The resurrection includes every Jewish believer who has died. Every Jewish believer who has died. In the doctrine of resurrection, we recognize Jesus Christ as the first of humanity concerning resurrection. Let me tell you something. Everybody says, well, what about Lazarus? When Jesus resuscitated, yeah, you got that right, resuscitated Lazarus. Lazarus lived for a few more years and then died like everybody else. Resurrection is eternal or, or everlasting. Eternal meaning heavenly, everlasting meaning in the lake of fire. Christ is the first of all humanity to be resurrected. He's the first fruits. Jesus Christ, the first fruits. 1 Corinthians 15, 23. Look at that on the board. 1 Corinthians 15, 23, Paul teaches, but what? But each in his own order. In other words, everything happens exactly how it's going to be. Christ is the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ's in union with him at his coming, verse 24, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to our God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. Look at the organization of, and how things are lockstep set in, the way things are going to happen. That's why I tell people, don't confuse the rapture and the second advent and, and think you're in the tribulation right now. I can tell you, and even people have asked about the mark of the beast. I showed you a scripture last lesson about the mark of the beast. I believe it was last lesson. You don't get that until you're in the tribulation. Now, what do I believe? My personal study, what the Holy Spirit reveals to me personally, is a lot of this vaccine stuff going on has to do with prepping people for the mark of the beast. And people are so oh so willing to put their arms out. And they're finding out now, uh-oh, not sure that was a good idea. Lesson for another day. But are we being prepared? Is the foundation being 
uh, laid? Is there a dry run? Absolutely. You're watching it unfold. The reign of Jesus Christ upon the earth begins with a war and ends quickly with the glory and victory always going to our Lord. Amen? Always. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ secures the victory which completes the plan of God the Father and all that remains will be a thousand years of perfection followed by what? A small rebellion at the end of a thousand years because we're never satisfied with perfection even with Christ on earth. That is squashed and then you see final judgment. 1 Corinthians 15, 25, and the Apostle Paul goes on to write what? For he must reign. For he must, Jesus Christ, must reign. It's the order of things. Until he has put all his enemies under his feet, ours as well. This is a reference first to the thousand years of his rulership here on earth after the second advent. And everything's cleaned up. Then the thousand years begins. His rulership on earth. And then what happens? The great white throne judgment. After the thousand years and the little rebellion. That is, when Christ comes back for the second time, all the enemies are in submission. Even when that little rebellion happens, it's a joke. Christ goes like this, and it's over. The second resurrection we can look at points to us. What do I mean? Church age believers, the body of Christ. We're part of the second resurrection. It's noted in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 18. I'll put some on the board for you, but I want you to write them down. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58. 1 John 3, 1 and 2. Philippians 3, 21. John 14, 1 and 3, as well as a few other scriptures. Don't worry, I'll repeat them. You can jot them down. I've covered them already in some of these lessons. You guys should become familiar with these. The second resurrection happens at the rapture for church age believers. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 and 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I would suggest reading all of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, all of 1 Corinthians 15 as well. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Philippians 3, 21. John chapter 14, 1 and 3 as well as a few other scriptures. We're going to get ready to close shortly and do the Lord's Supper. Please go to Revelation chapter 20. Last book in the Bible. Revelation chapter 20. The church is resurrected at when? At the end of the church age. Well, when's the end of the church age? The definitive end of the church age is the rapture of the church. That puts a period on the end of the church age done the age that interrupted israel is the church age what happens after the rapture the age of israel opens back up for seven more years but it's discipline first thessalonians chapter four the church age is resurrected when at the end of the church age rapture first thessalonians 4 16 for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. Remember, I just showed you the symbolism in the second advent when the angels go up with trumpets as well. Very similar. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Church age believers. Jew or Gentile, if you lived in the church age and you're a believer and you passed away, you will rise first. Verse 17, then we who are alive, believers, who remain, who are there during this time, will be caught up together, and that terminology is from the Latin, it's rapture, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. There it is, rapture of the church, end of the church age really a second resurrection we can look at because we are in union with Christ. Now, those Jewish believers at the second advent that are called up are part of a resurrection as well when you think about it, similar fashion. All church age believers will be resurrected from the time that the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ went to the cross at Calvary 
and ignited the new dispensation until the time of the rapture. Really, a lot of people say that was the kickoff, was the cross, because the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit began to indwell everybody, really is a, a, a beginning of the church age, but the cross was the definitive point of the pivot. The third resurrection, then, what? That occurs at the second advent. Guys are seeing how it all comes together? The resurrection of the Jews. Israel of the past plus the Jews who were martyred in the tribulation are covered here. For all accounts, the Jews who were even martyred in the tribulation. Daniel 12, 13. Some of these I just covered. Isaiah 26, 19 through 20. Revelation 20, verse 4. And of course our study, Matthew 24, 31. Scripture aligns with Scripture. I'll give you a moment, a moment to take a note. I know there's a lot of information here, folks. I know. I've gotten a few questions already about certain things. You're going to have to let this whole chapter study go, go through and then take notes because all I'm going to do is answer you quickly or send you back. I'll send you some notes or send you back to an older video eventually. That's the best way because you cannot rely on... Um, even your pastor to constantly be there at your beck and call to answer every little question. You're supposed to be studying in the Word. And a good student, yes, they raise their hand and ask questions, but they're not constantly occupying all the teacher's time. Everybody else needs to hear it as well. So I'm trying to answer the questions as I go. I'm giving you a lot of information. Relax and absorb it. Wait to the end before you ask all your questions. Any believer who will die during the millennial reign, the thousand years, for any reason, they will be resurrected at the end of the millennium. That's how that works. Hopefully that answers that question. <laughs> Revelation 24. I understand. I get it. I get it. But if you're really sitting under a pastor teacher who teaches you accurately, all your answers, if you're patient, all your answers come out eventually. And you're supposed to sit there and put this piece together and grow line upon line, precept upon precept, a little here, a little there as you go. And you're supposed to go back on your old notes and old messages and say, oh, yeah, that makes sense from a year ago now that he's telling me this today. That's how it works, folks. That's how you'll become somebody who not only has knowledge but wisdom. Revelation 24. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them. And judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus. Now, little side note, one of the reasons that I think the Islamic movement is a big part of the end times concerning uh, Antichrist has to do with the beheading. I don't know a lot of religious movements and cultures that do beheading and chopping of hands and heads. I only know one, and I only know one religion that really emphasizes it. Maybe I'm wrong. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. When does that happen? Tribulation. And those who had not worshipped the beast. Tribulation. Or his image. And had not received, there it is, I thought I gave it to you last lesson, there it is, not received the mark of the beast on their foreheads or on their hands. The mark is supposed to be on the right arm or on the forehead or both. Another interesting thing I found out and I thought about was a lot of the Islamic fighters like to put that band on their arm and their head. I don't know, who knows what. I think it has more to do with AI and computer chips than anything else. But I just find all this interesting. It's fun to speculate, relax. Those who had not worshiped the beast in the seven years tribulation or his image, they haven't fall for the one world religious system, one world movement. They're believers and not receive the mark on their foreheads and their hands. Many of them, they may have their heads chopped off. And they came to life and re reigned with Christ for a thousand years. There it is. That answers the question. What happens during the seven year tribulation and you're a believer? Yes, it's a horrible time. You're going to reign with Christ if you're a believer. If you refuse the beast system means you're a believer. Plain and simple. We're not there yet, folks. We're not there yet. That's talking about the seven-year tribulation period. 
Now, are we being prepared? Yes, I believe so. I believe it's a dry run what's going on. Those believers, whether Jew or Gentile, in the seven years of tribulation will be resurrected. That answers that question. The thousand years of Christ's reign begins with all believers. The thousand years of Christ's reign on earth, second advent, begins with all believers. Now, they will end after the thousand years with some unbelievers because everybody's going to have children during that time, families, and people will start to reject, just like they did in the garden, the perfect Messiah, the perfect world. So the thousand years of Christ's reign begins with all believers, just as the seven years of tribulation begins with all unbelievers. All the believers are taken up in the rapture. So the seven years of tribulation, obviously, starts off with all unbelievers. I would guess about 10 minutes after the rapture of the church, some people will come to believe because you, or maybe me or somebody, told them about the rapture and it made sense. Now they realize, uh-oh, I'm here for the next seven years. I better believe in Christ. This is real. But it begins with all unbelievers, seven years of tribulation. Revelation 25 goes on to say what? The rest of the dead did not come to life until what? The thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Don't be confused. Understand Revelation 5 is actually answering Revelation 4. Revelation 25 is answering Revelation 24. Don't be confused about the first resurrection. Is related to the seven years of tribulation. That's what it's related to. This scripture is included as the answer to verse 4. Understand how scripture is interpreted. Everyone will be resurrected for the final judgment. Everyone will be resurrected for the final judgment, just so you know that. But this first resurrection has to do with the seven years of tribulation. What happens after that? Then we reboot, reboot again, and we have a first resurrection. We've already dealt with Jesus Christ being the first fruits, church age believers being the second resurrection, the uh, Jews being called at the second advent of Christ after the war of Armageddon, called up. That being the third resurrection that stops. Now you're looking at resurrections related to the seven-year tribulation. You do not die and have your soul go to sleep. I don't care what some philosophy major tells you. You do not die and your soul just goes to sleep. And you come back as a rock or a tree or a squirrel. Sorry to tell you. It is an eternal life in heaven or an everlasting life of torment separated from God. One or the other. One or the other. There are holding patterns, however you want to look at it, or in the case of unbelievers, the place or a compartment of Hades, which is where the soul stays until the final judgment, and then comes the lake of fire. That's what I'm telling you. And it's not a purgatory you can pray your way out of. Uh-oh, once you're dead, once this body is worn out and gone, your soul goes on. But you've already made your decision to believe upon Jesus Christ. Time is up. As I mentioned before, everyone will face the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ at one point. Even the scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees will face him. The Roman soldiers who crucified him will face him. Pontius Pilate will face the judgment in front of Christ. Everyone. Death is not the end. Death is not the end. It's not what the Bible teaches. Your physical body, your physical body is not who you truly are. That is an outward vessel. Like my Jeep sitting outside. It looks right and pretty good right now. It's a 2019. I try to keep it in good shape. Ten years from now, it's not going to look the same. I'm probably going to have some rust spots on it. You follow? Your body is not who you are. Your soul is. Your body is an outward vessel. Your soul is a living, breathing thinking and feeling entity your soul that's who you are it's a living breathing thinking feeling entity our lord became human to be able to suffer the consequences for us and we're going to bring him into remembrance so you want to be prepared 
He's the first fruit to be resurrected in his humanity for us. His life, death, and resurrection ensure us that we too share in eternal security forever. His life, death, and resurrection. Without that, we are nothing. We are in union with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, simply for what? Believing upon who he is and what he did. That is it. That is it. No effort or merits on our part. Divine grace is that which is given that you cannot attain on your own. Divine grace is that which is given that you cannot attain on your own. It is not only out of reach. We all deserve the exact opposite of grace. Every one of us was born in sin. God's grace is given because left on our own, we are headed to that final judgment I just showed you in the lake of fire, separated from God forever, everlasting life. Instead, we are joined into the royal family of God. Amen? Not because we earned it or deserved it. Oh, no, no, no. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes upon him will be saved and brought into eternal life eternal security and given our union with Christ the righteousness of Christ that is not only the altar call folks that is your wake up call if you've been away from the Lord not only an altar call that's a wake up call Acts 4.12 tells us what and there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name Jesus Christ under the heaven that has been given among mankind by which we must be saved. Do not be fooled. It's not about you being a good boy or a good girl. It's got nothing to do with it. No other name under heaven you need to believe. There is no other name under the heavens that you can be saved. And there is no other name under the heavens that you can grow to your fulfill and fulfill, really, your God-given potential. No other name except the name of Jesus Christ. So if you're a believer that's been away, you can't do anything aside from Jesus Christ, his mind studying it in his nature. If you're an unbeliever, you can do nothing to get yourself into heaven except for believe on Jesus Christ. He gave it all for you and I. And we need to work, we need not, excuse me, a little bit preaching here, and need not work. He gave it all for you and I. We need not work for it from our flesh, but accept it and acknowledge who he is and what he did for us. We should do that each and every day. Amen. Let us bring him into remembrance now as we recall the night on which Jesus Christ was so bitterly betrayed, and he was. Our Lord broke the bread and giving thanks, he raised it up and stated, this is my body, take and eat. Let us eat the bread. And in remembrance of our Lord, in the same fashion, our Lord gave thanks as he lifted the cup and said, this is my blood, the blood of a new and everlasting covenant. Each time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you shall call me into remembrance. I ask now that we also remember the Lord as we drink the cup. Let us drink. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And Father, we just want to be reminded every day of the power and the union we have with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and bring him into remembrance with respect and his authority. And Father, we patiently and eagerly we are patient, but we are eager deep inside to await when we are face to face with you. We are asking that these messages and these followers of this message take these messages out to a lost and dying world. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.